Ave Maria, the following program discusses adult themes. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon. Welcome to our afternoon session on Friday. Uh, I think we all appreciate the complexity of the problem of same-sex attraction. And in the approach of the church to this very sensitive and, and controversial question, the order of nature and the order of grace are always respected. You know that we live in two worlds at the same time. The order of nature is the order that is the, the created order of time and accessible to the senses and reason and cause and effect. And then there is the order of grace, which is that world to which uh, we have welcomed by virtue of our baptism. And that is the world of eternity and the life, the divine life of God and is not accessible immediately to the senses. And while many things, of course, are reasonable, and understandable by the human mind, there is also the virtue of faith, which is necessary to grasp these things. So we live in these two worlds, nature and grace, and the question of same-sex attraction is one that pertains to both. I don't think anyone would find it credible to say that if we just say a few prayers, that will relieve and solve the difficulty. We know that that is not the case. Having said that, though, we also don't want to diminish the, important of the, the importance of the sacramental life and the good which prayer brings to us, something that Cardinal Burke commended to us in the talk last night. Well, with those thoughts in mind, I'm very happy to welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Sean Stevens, who's going to give a talk this afternoon that I think is going to help to draw on both of these, nature and grace, and he's uniquely qualified to do that as a Catholic clinical psychologist with a practice in Omaha, but also a degree in theology. Now, we want to keep these two realms distinct, but we only have one body, one soul, one mind, one heart, so it's not as though we are separate, but we want to maintain that proper distinction so that we know when we are speaking about one and speaking about the other. So we're very happy. I met Dr. Stevens last year for the first time at this conference, and he was in touch with me afterwards and said, I think I have an idea for a presentation. And he sent it in, and we looked it over, and he said, that would be good. And so now we're going to hear it. Dr. Stevens. Well, technical difficulties at the beginning of a talk sometimes mean that the evil one doesn't want the talk to happen. So that's maybe a good sign. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to start just with a brief prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, thank you for being here, and I thank you, Lord, for the, the genuine courage of these men and women who are struggling with same-sex attraction, as well as the love and courage of their parents. And I ask you, Lord God Almighty, that the words that I speak be your words, that what I speak might be helpful, and might touch hearts just as they need to be touched, uh, we ask this through uh, the intercession of St. Joseph, uh, the Blessed Mother, and St. Michael the Archangel, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Okay, uh, that was, uh, that was a, a, a great intro, because I certainly want to convey that, uh, don't want to have a reductionistic kind of approach where, yeah, as Father uh, Chuck was saying, you just... If you just pray enough, you'll get over the, the same-sex issue because that's it's simply not true. So this is certainly supplementary. The, the people I know who have moved from same-sex attraction into a growing experience of heterosexual attraction, um, ha it's, it's a lengthy process, and it's one that takes certainly incorporates a, a lot of psychotherapy as often as well as prayer, a lot of healing through through good, healthy uh, relationships with mentors or peers of the same sex, uh, as well as uh, 
just healing and, and restoration on all sorts of levels that would be more on the order of nature. But what I've also found with people dealing with this is that um, there can some, be very powerful things that happen through prayer, but not a prayer along the lines of, God, please take away my same-sex attraction and, and make me completely heterosexual. It's, it's more uh, a process, a kind of a soaking process, really soaking in the Lord and allowing him to heal, uh, sometimes to, to kind of do some plowing so that uh, if people are going to therapy, that, that things have been turned up in a healthy way so that they can then address them in therapy. Or if things have come up in therapy, then the healing can get, the, the prayer can get them over certain humps. And often, as in, you know, it's always hard to make a one-to-one -one correspondence between um, I spent such and such time in Eucharistic adoration, and this was the direct effect of it. It's, it's a much subtler kind of thing. It happens over time. And, and uh, the people that I've worked with who have experienced healing through things like Eucharistic adoration, it has been a, a, a subtle, long but uh, process, but with real results. Um, the title of the talk is something along the lines of, because it's gotten several titles, it, something like Catholic Prayer and Devotion, a Multimodal Approach to Healing of Gender Identity. Is, is the, 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 that's not what you have in your handout, but it's close enough. Okay. And I just added a slide. Okay, just a second. You don't see the slide because we're experiencing technical <laughs> <laughs> difficulties. Okay, I just added another slide. Okay, here we go. Um, okay, I'm going to start with more of the, the psychological, and it's about um, the different needs that men and women have who are dealing with SSA. So, and what's the need for healing? I'll, I'll first go into what the main need for healing is going to be in the area of attachment. Uh, the nature of the attachment to the father and the nature of the attachment to the mother for men and women with SSA. I want to emphasize that it doesn't mean that if you have SSA that, that you have a bad father or a bad mother. It, it has to do with, as I'm sure you've heard before, perceptions. And it can be even tiny incidents that the mother or the father might not even realize are disrupting the attachment. So this isn't a blame mom or blame dad kind of thing. It's just saying that at some point the attachment between the person and mother, the person and father, gets disrupted. So the, the, the approach I'm going to be talking about here has to do with the healing through prayer has to do with mainly with attachment to God the Father, attachment to Mary our mother, attachment to Mary also as, as, a, as a, a peer for, for women of the same gender, attachment to Jesus as a peer of the same gender for men. So that's, that's where it's going to be going. So in terms of the, just the basis, uh, the lack of attachment that tends to happen for men with uh, same-sex attraction, the father tends to be perceived as detached, or unreliable, or intimidating, and the mother tends to be perceived as overwhelming, intrusive, needy. Again, it doesn't necessarily mean they are, but this is the perception. For women with SSA, the need for healing comes also in the relationship with the father and the mother, but for women, it's going to be more often the father's perceived as emotionally absent, or unpredictable, or angry, and the mother is going to be perceived as needy or abandoning or incompetent. The basic problem is, and again this is a question of perception, is each of the parents is going to appear to the child to be wrapped up in their own needs. The child is not going to feel seen for who he or she is. Um, and the child is going to end up feeling, I have to become who so-and-so wants me to be. Now, for the, for the male, he's often going to conform his identity to what he thinks his mom wants him to be. So the, kind of the typical thing would be that the, the guy with same-sex attraction tries to be a good little boy so that his mother will, will approve of him. Now, that's not always how it works, but often how it works. Uh, the girl might try to become a tough little girl so she can get her father's approval. Uh, what... Th what the, the man is going to do about his dad is often going to be this defensive detachment, which is 
I can't please him. It doesn't matter what I do. It, it just doesn't work, and I'm, I cut him off. I'm, I'm not going to try to attach with him, and if he tries to attach with me, I'm, I'm not going to let that happen. It's a similar dynamic between the, a woman with same-sex attraction and her mother. Now, this is not always a conscious kind of thing. I, I, uh, one client I was working with, when I first talked with him about his family, He's like, well, there was no lack of dad. My, my dad was there all the time. But as we went further, he, he, it, we did get to the, the, the sense that his dad was very much there for him, but there was just not this attunement. They didn't, he was, uh, my client was interested in very different things than his dad was, and his dad would go to, say, a theater production, but he wouldn't be enthused, enthused about it. He would be present, but... But the, this was a teen. The teen was just, he knew that his father's heart wasn't into it, and that was kind of where the attunement would have happened. My dad is proud of me for going with this rather than my dad accepts it, but it's not his bag. Uh, so what needs to happen in terms of the healing of attachment, and this is now going into the order of grace, the healing of attachment in the order of nature would be you know, having healthy uh, relationships with the same sex and the opposite sex, experiencing, for men, for instance, experiencing approval from uh, male mentors, of experiencing acceptance from um, same-sex friends, in a, you know, obviously in a non-sexual way. So that's, that's how it happens on the psychological level. But on the prayer level, the point is to connect through prayer through a reparative experience of connection with um, a father and a mother primarily who are perfectly attuned to you all the time. So God the Father is always attuned to me all the time. He is there 24-7, always emotionally available. I'm sure all of us have experienced in, in life, we can have, say, very good friendships but the person is not always emotionally present. They have a bad day. I'm married. My my wife and I are not always perfectly attuned to each other. She has bad days. She's a saint, but she, she does have one or two bad days in the course of our marriage. And I have, <laughs> I, I have bad days. And she, can, she, she, she wouldn't say that I did, but I, I do. So even in a, in a, in a marriage, uh, you're not going to be perfectly attuned to each other because you're, you're both human beings. You get tired. You're still alone in the relationship to some extent. But with God, the Father, and the Blessed Mother, our Mother, there's this, there's this constant attunement. They're always there. You know, just call my name, man. I'll, I'm going to keep my day job. So, um, <laughs> Something else, and, and I don't know how to kind of put this into this framework, but I found it to be very important, is... Um, according to kind of the psychological model, you would think that Jesus would be particularly important for men dealing with same-sex attraction because he's, he would be the same-sex peer to connect with on the spiritual level. But actually, he's very important. At, well, Jesus is just very important, but he's, both imp he's very important for, not to make an overstatement or anything like that, <laughs> but, but he's um, important on both levels. Um, for women dealing with same-sex attraction, one of the things that didn't happen with their dad often or wasn't perceived as happening is he wasn't calling forth their femininity. He was not, they, they would felt like he wasn't pursuing their feminine side. He would tend to or be perceived as affirming her masculine side but not, not her femininity. So Jesus as spouse, passionate spouse, th you know, think of the Song of Songs, is something that can be really important for for women, but also for men, and this isn't just for men with same-sex attraction. I mean, th there's, there's a spousal relationship that the Lord is calling all of us to, male or female. So Jesus for men is, is not just important in terms of this ex totally accepting same-sex peer, but also very, very important in terms of, I, I don't know how to, we need to know that someone loves us with this lover's passion whether we're male or female, and that would be Jesus. Uh, because we believe in the communion of saints, of course, there might be, we, we can form attachments with anybody, like St. Therese is my honey. I just love her to pieces. Uh, 
St. Philip Neri is, is one of my fave raves, you know, this kind of thing. So that's also a, a, this attachment can happen with all of these things. One of the things that's more or less unique with, uh, with the Catholic Church is that it addresses an aspect of attachment that has to do with the senses. Attachment happens through the senses. So when a baby attaches to mom and dad, it's... You know, it can be the taste of the mother's milk, the feel of the dad's beard, the, the smell of her perfume or his cologne or that kind of thing, the feeling of being held. Uh, there's a very sensory aspect to attachment. You're probably familiar with the, those poor monkeys. Uh, I forget the name of the psychologist, but he did. Harlow, the poor monkeys who only had these wire dolls to, to cling to, their mommy figures, and they didn't do very well with that, you know. So we need something warm and either fuzzy or smooth to, to hang on to. And Catholic prayers and devotions really involve the senses in a way that maybe high church Episcopalians do, but they have other problems, and I won't go into that. Uh, sorry, sorry, I didn't say that, but anyway. Um, uh, but, you know, we have, we have incense. You go into the, 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 the main chapel, and it's just a, a feast for the senses. There's so many beautiful things there, the the music, we hear, we see, we touch, we taste in Catholicism, the holy water, oil, it involves our senses. We use images much more generally than uh, uh, than evangelical Protestants. Uh, You know, having an icon when you're praying, it it engages the senses. Uh, The vision thing, you know, a, a lot of how a baby attaches to mom is there's this gaze that goes on back and forth. It's just, you know, it's, you've all seen it. It's beautiful. Okay. So what I'm going to be doing in my talk uh, is to, uh, this is going to be the structure. I'm going to be talking about um, various Catholic prayer approaches, three of them, actually. And I'm going to illustrate the method, and then I'm going to give some real-life examples of, of people who, with same-sex attraction, who have experienced healing. And I'm going to apologize beforehand because the same the the vast majority of the work that I've done has been with men. So I'm not I'm not going to be able to give any examples with women. But I am very confident that these will work with women with same-sex attraction. Uh, and uh, and the only women I've worked with the same-sex attraction have happened to be evangelical Protestants who aren't into e- Eucharistic adoration and, and that kind of thing. So. The approaches I'm going to be using are uh, Lexio Divina, uh, Eucharistic Adoration, and, I'm going to, and the, it's Eucharistic Adoration forward slash contemplation. I realize that contemplative prayer is not the same thing as Eucharistic Adoration. With Eucharistic Adoration, you're sitting before the Lord. He looks at you. You look at him. But there is the real presence. With contemplation, there is an overlap, though, that where you're sitting before the Lord, you look at him, he looks at you, but the presence of the Lord is the more, you know, his presence throughout all creation, his presence in your heart, but you don't have the real presence with Eucharistic adoration. So the high-octane version, of course, is Eucharistic adoration, but if you don't have a Eucharistic chapel, I don't mean that irreverently, this is just how how I think of it. The high-octane version is Eucharistic adoration because you have Jesus present, body, blood, soul, and divinity, kind of like sitting in front of a nuclear reactor. But the, um, in a good way, I mean... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> in contemplation, you know, th- there is the real, pre- the, the Lord is truly present. Well, well, you know the difference between the real presence and that. I don't have to explain this. Okay. One of my fears in terms of, of, of giving this talk is you folks in general are pretty advanced in terms of your spirituality. That's the impression that I got from the last, uh, being here last time and last year and, and this year. So a lot of this might, it could be stuff that you know already, but I it can always, it can't hurt to be reminded, and I, you know, and my prayer has been, you know, Lord, please uh, give somebody, give each person here a nugget from my talk. Okay. Uh, now, Lexio Divina, which is, uh, how many people know what Lexio Divina is? Okay. Lexio Divina me- means divine reading, and uh, uh, it has to do with going through a scripture passage and putting yourself into the scripture passage. 
or reading the scripture passage very slowly and really chewing on it, taking a lot of time. Like there can be one word that really grabs you and you just stick with that. I'll explain it a little bit more. Um, Eucharistic adoration, I'm I'm sure everybody's familiar with. And then contemplative prayer again is this sitting before the Lord. It's not talking to him. It's not really even listening to him. And I'll explain this a little bit more. It's just being with him. He gazes on you. You gaze on him. It's it's extremely simple, even though, as many of you, I'm sure, have found, it's, it's difficult to practice. Easy to explain, difficult to practice, but wonderful. Um, so in terms of Lexio Divina, this, this chewing over scripture and adoration and contemplation, um, it can address Lexio Divina, going over scripture passages, can address all sorts of attachment needs, depending on what the passage is. It can address attachment needs having to do with um, uh, God the Father or one's father, Mary our mother, one's mother, sisters, brothers, same-sex peers. Um, Eucharistic adoration is more, uh, of course, addressed toward Jesus, since Jesus is the one that we are adoring. And then contemplative prayer can be about any of the members of the Trinity, but it's more, well, it depends. It can be about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, or the Trinity all at once. Um, so the three approaches are Lexio Divina, Eucharistic Adoration, Contemplation, or Acts of Consecration. Um, acts of Consecration, a well-known one would be the demand for consecration of, of giving myself over entirely to the Blessed Mother for her to, to give me to Jesus. Uh, consecration to the Sacred Heart it would be another one. Um, And acts of consecration are are very adaptable to whatever kind of relational wounds you're dealing with in terms of same-sex attraction. So going a little bit more into Lexio Divina, um, it basically is chewing on a word or a verse or a passage from Scripture. The Word of God is also uniquely attuned to each of our unique needs. The the wound with same-sex attraction is going going to be tied into my one or both parents are not satisfied with who I really, really am, so I have to become somebody else. And God, in with Lexio Divina, with praying through Scripture, what he does is affirm who we are right now. We don't have to change anything whatsoever for him to love us and for him to connect with us. So it is very much connected with attunement. Um, so a passage that's going to speak to one person in Lexio Divina might mean nothing, for some, or very little for somebody else. So it's important when a person is doing the Lexio Divina to be attuned to, uh, to uh, how many times have I used the word attuned, but to be tuned into um, what, what, what moves your heart, what stirs you. It's very important to go with what stirs you. And as I say, it might not be what stirs somebody else. So it's important to think of, of what images of God uh, grab you the most. I, w- I was at a prayer meeting, and uh, uh, the, the leader of the prayer meeting said, uh, okay, we're going to break up into small groups, which are words that usually fill me with dread. <laughs> By the way, I'd like you all to break up. And- no, just kidding. But, <laughs> but this was actually the only good experience I've ever had of breaking up into small groups, because what we did was talked about um, uh, what images of God ministered to us the most. And as I went through my images of God, I realized they all had to do with God as my protector, my rock, my guardian, my shepherd. It was all about feeling safe and protected. And with some of my father issues, I realized, oh, well, that would make sense because my dad was uh, went to World War II when he was 16 years old, lied about his age, and his mother signed for him. He went through some horrendous experiences, and he came back with kind of a temper. And so he could be pretty scary to be around. And I realized what... So that told me the healing that I needed in my father relationship had to do with I needed to feel safe and protected. And those, those, verse, those kind of scriptures really grab me. Um, so for some people, they connect with God as father or as guardian or shepherd, Jesus as brother, friend, spouse the bread of life, water. I thought it was so cool that we sang that song, I heard the voice of Jesus say at the opening mass, 
It really addresses how Jesus meets our every need. So for some of us, what grabs us is Jesus says nourishment because maybe we felt starved as a child or, or continue to feel starved. Some people, the Holy Spirit grabs them as consoler and, and kind of gentle breeze. For other people, he grabs them as fire. You know? So it just depends partly on your temperament, partly on what you need. Um, so there's just some, uh, don't ever do that again. <laughs> <laughs> Throw him out. Oh, no, okay. <laughs> that would be the fire of the Holy Spirit you just saw there. Okay. okay. So I'm just going to throw, throw out some images, uh, and I don't expect you to write these down, but these are the kind of passages that might speak to you. Are you Lazarus, bound up and needed, needing to be rained, uh, raised from death? Are you the woman caught in adultery, unexpectedly freed from condemnation? Uh, there's a passage in John, uh, John 5, where Jesus goes up to this paralyzed man and says, do you want to be healed? And the man doesn't answer him. He says, well, I've been lying here waiting, you know, but I can't get to the water in time. And I think with some people I've worked with with same-sex attraction, I've had them go to John 5, those first few verses, 1 to 5 or so, and just go into, do I want to be healed? And I'm not saying, oh, you could just be healed if you wanted to, but it's the question of, with people dealing with same-sex attraction, it does fill a particular hole in their heart. I mean, it's, it's so powerful for a very, very good reason because it feeds into the father need and the mother need and the brother need. So a passage to wrestle with can be that one of, am I, am I ready to let this go? Because there's going to be, with any kind of healing, any kind of addiction is the same thing. There's going to be this ambivalence of, on the one hand, I can't stand this, and I'd give anything to be freed from it. And the other hand, it's like, but, you know, gee, what if I'm not left with anything at all? So it's important uh, to, to wrestle with that kind of thing. Uh, some people identify with the prodigal son. Some people identify with the, the dry bones in Ezekiel, you know, that thing of discouragement. My hope is cut off. Gosh, I'm a mess, you know. That kind of thing. Um, the bride in the Song of Songs, um, wanting the Lord's embrace. There's a wonderful passage, which you may be familiar with, Hosea 11, 1 to 4. Um, see if I can get through without breaking, bursting into tears. Uh, when Israel was a child, I loved him. Out of Egypt, I called my son. I raised him as a, as a father raised an, raises an infant to his cheeks, but though I stooped to feed him, he did not know that I was his healer. What an image of God the Father. Now, this is before Jesus, of course. This is the Old Testament. It doesn't get much better than that in the Old Testament. That can be a very healing image because for different reasons, men or women with SSA, may not, even though their fathers, might have, fathers may have been that way, would not have experienced him that way and that tenderness. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Um, what images of the Blessed Mother grab you? Mary is in, in some place, you know, she's a disciple. She's a joyful mother. She's a mother of sorrows. She's a queen. She's an intercessor. Something that men and women with SSA, because they, they're often dealing with... Um, I would say invariably, dealing with, with shame issues. So Mary Magdalene can be pretty powerful for them. It's, it's just striking the passages about her. What a tender relationship she has with Jesus Christ. The passage, the Easter passage, where he turns to her, Mary, he knows her, calls her by name. We need that. We need that with Jesus. So the process, there's, 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 a, uh, there's more options than this, I'm sure, but two options for the Lexio Divina, the chewing on scripture. You can just take a, 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 a favorite passage um, or have, if you have a spiritual director, uh, uh, have them recommend it, recommend some passages, and then you just chew on it. Uh, 
that Hosea 11, 1 to 4 could be one, Isaiah 43, verses 1 to 7, which is what the song Be Not Afraid is based on, uh, about when you walk through the water, you know, rivers that you shall not drown. That can be powerful because there can often be a sense of lack of safety. But the idea is you just go through the passage and you take as long as it takes. And you might get through the first three words and you just stop there and chew on it and soak it in. It really is bread, the word of God. Um, be aware of what stirs your heart. What's, it's very important to pay attention to what stirs your heart. And then you dialogue with the Lord about it. You talk with them. It's very helpful to have a journal. Some people hate journals, but if you're a journaling type or not, if you don't hate it, you can try journaling about what happens in your heart as you're reading the passage. So that's one way of doing Lexio Divina. The other way would be um, if it's a kind of a narrative or a story, you picture the place. Um, for example, uh, you involve all the senses that you can. This is right out of Ignatius, by the way, St. Ignatius. What does it look like, smell like, feel like, taste like, sound like? Um, what character are you in the story is important. You know, if you went to the, the story of the woman caught in adultery, it would be a little scary if you were one of, well, but it could be, maybe you're one of the Pharisees that wants to, st to stone her to death, you know. I mean, usually we tend to identify with the woman, but maybe we're just looking on. With the prodigal son, using this as an example, um, are you the prodigal son? What does everything look like? You know, picture the place, you know, what's the temperature? What's the landscape? What does the father look like? What does the older brother look like? Are you the older brother? Are you just kind of on the outside looking in? Are you a by bystander watching what's going on? I mean, on, on the psychological level, there's a reason that you're going to identify with one person, and that, that'll be useful to journal. Gee, why did I feel like I was that person? Um, Lord, what's going on? The more vividly you can p picture it, the better, and take as much time as you need to. Take, pay attention to what stirs your heart and, uh, and go with it. Dialogue with the Lord about it. Uh, Ignatius does a three-part dialogue. I think it's a three-part. It's a dialogue with the Lord, dialogue with the Blessed Mother, and I believe dialogue with your guardian angel, unless I'm mixing him up with St. Francis de Sales. But anyway, you can do this dialogue, you know, t talk to them about it. Uh, as an example, there was one man I was working with, he experienced the following. Um, he was going through Isaiah chapters 39 through 55, which is the book of consolation in Isaiah. It has some just gorgeous patches. He found them very nourishing and healing. Um, he had found his father to be rejecting, and he just got the message that he was a burden to the family and to his family, uh, that it would be better off if he weren't around. And in Isaiah 39, the Lord keeps talking to Israel about being chosen. I've redeemed you. I've called you by name. You are mine. You're precious and glorious in my sight, and I love you. And it's all about being chosen. It's not an accident. And that was so healing for this gentleman. Um, it, the, what came through for him is that he was meant to be. It was not an accident. That was really powerful for him. Okay, the next thing I'd like to talk about is... If I can find it. Eucharistic adoration and contemplative prayer. Um, both of them are different ways of experiencing God's loving, available presence and attention to me just as I am. What same, people with same-sex attraction have generally not experienced much with their parents, and again, it can be a question of perception, is the sense of their presence and seeing them just as they are and being there for however much time however available the person needs the mom or dad to be there. With Eucharistic adoration, you know, you go to the right chapel, Jesus is always there. And you sit there, and he gazes on you, and you gaze on him, and there's an attunement there. He's perfectly present to you. Uh, there's a wonder, uh, and then with contemplative prayer, again, you don't have the Eucharistic presence. You just, you sit with the Lord. It usually ha helps to have an image or something, a crucifix or an icon or something like that. 
and just be aware that he's gazing on you and you're gazing on him. Uh, There's a wonderful book on contemplative prayer, which many of you may have read, called When the Well Runs Dry. How many people have read When the Well Runs Dry? Not many. Excellent book. Go out, get it. It's it's good. It's in its like third edition or something. But it's called When the Well Runs Dry, and it's by Thomas Green, as in the color, S.J. And it 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 does has a wonderful explanation of what contemplative prayer is and why it's so important. Um, so. I found that some people with SSA, because they have so much, so many shame issues about their body, either seeing their body as an object of seduction, feeling ashamed of things that they've done with their body sexually, or feeling ashamed of their body, how their body is as a man or as a woman. Shame issues around the body are very common. It can be helpful in doing the Eucharistic adoration or the contemplative prayer not to actually take off your clothes, but to actually to imagine yourself literally naked before the Lord and let him look at you just as you are and know that he's loving you, loving you, loving you just as you are. That's, that can be a very healing um, experience. I want to explain briefly because I think people can be confused about this. When I'm talking about contemplative prayer, exactly more, what is that? Um, a contemplative prayer is doing nothing before the Lord. And what it means is you, you have an image or an icon. You can do this before the Eucharist. Then it kind of blends that Eucharistic adoration, contemplative prayer. But you don't do anything at all. You sit before him and let him gaze at you. And there's kind of a method. You start out by being aware that you're in God's presence that he truly is all around you as well as within you because you're temples of the Holy Trinity. It can be helpful to make an act of faith that this is really prayer because when people are doing contemplative prayer, when they're just sitting before the Lord, a big question is like, is this prayer? Is anything even going on? Someone was talking about, Jaron was talking about dryness. You know, there's often a tremendous sense of dryness in the contemplative prayer, and you really need to make an act of faith that something is going on. So I'd say start out at maybe 15 minutes a day if you've never done contemplative prayer, and then kind of graduate up to an hour. Um, I've noticed when I go to Eucharistic Adoration that a lot of people seem to be filling up the Eucharistic Adoration time with reading and praying the rosary. Nothing against reading or praying the rosary or reading the Bible, certainly those are good things. But I'd encourage you, if you do Eucharistic Adoration, set aside a block of time where you're not doing anything. You're just sitting with him. I call it radiation therapy. It really is. It's radiation therapy. There's something, just as if you're sitting in front of a, you know, when people are going through radiation therapy, I've never done done that, but I I wonder if they even have any sense of anything that's going on until gradually they see the, the effects. This is radiation therapy. It's important to know that it's more about him gazing on you than you gazing on him. It's important to know that he is so excited to have you there. He's just, he's just waiting. And, and when you're there, it's like, oh, my gosh, I get to spend time with Sean. This is fantastic. It doesn't get any better than this. He's far more into it than you are. It's, 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 it's ridiculous. <laughs> um. So the, just to emphasize, because it seems people have a hard time with this, the prayer is simply sitting in his presence. It's not petitions. It's not the rosary. It's not journaling. It's not reading. It's not listening prayer. Those are all good things. But if you're going to do the contemplative prayer and, and this type of Eucharistic adoration, you don't do any of these things. You just sit there. Now be ready for your thoughts to be off to the races almost immediately. I found that if I've seen a movie that I really like the night before, this tends to be disastrous because what I'm doing during my contemplative prayer is I'm running through the scenes from the movie one by one. I, I have a very visual memory, and I can't remember like if my brother-in-law's mother died, but I can remember every line of you know such and such a movie. So, um, I, I heard an explanation of of this method of contemplative prayer where this Carmelite priest was talking about. Um, Suppose someone tells you there's this sunrise, there's this place in the mountains where you can see this most glorious sunrise. And so you go, 
You have your cup of coffee. It's, it's 6 in the morning. You got your lawn chair. You got your quilt. And you're, you're there. You're watching the edge of that mountain. You see the glow. And the sun starts rising. Now there's a river at the bottom of the mountain. As the sun starts rising, you notice your office desk with all the things that you haven't done floating down the river. And you're like, <laughs> you know. Oh, oh, wait a second. Right, I'm looking for the sunrise. Okay, here. <laughs> Focus, dude. Okay, so you're focused. Okay, and then you see your children with all of their problems or your, your brothers and sisters, your moms and dads, whatever it is, whatever is going on. It's, it's all floating down the river and you're like, oh. and then, oh, oh, that's right. Well, that's what contemplative prayer is like. Uh, I would say, I mean, there are days, there are times with it where the Lord just grabs you and, it's, and you experience his sweetness. It's very consoling. It's hard to tear yourself away. It's beautiful. That happens maybe 1% of the time, I would say. And the other, most of the other time is you're just continually bringing, gently bringing yourself back to, okay, that's right, Jesus. I'm gazing at you and you're gazing at me. And then 10 seconds later, you're off to the races. St. Teresa compared the imagination to a little dog where it's like, I can't do that, but come back, come back, you know, because it's going after this or that tree or fire hydrant or whatever. And so you just go, come on, come on, get back. Um, there is something really going on. One of the ways you know something really is really going on is that even though your prayer in contemplative prayer is dry, is usually dry, and there's no, there's only a very slight, uh, St. John of the Cross called it a very delicate perception that something is going on. You find in the rest of your life the ordinary becomes holy. So you get this growing conviction that there's no such thing as a conversation that doesn't involve the Lord. There's no event that doesn't involve the Lord. It's all, and there's no way to de- define wh- why you know that, but you know that you know that you know that everything is, has something to do with God. And that distinction between the part of my life that involves God and that doesn't, it just starts to fall away. It's all well, they say it's all good. It's all good. It's all about God. Uh, um, I th- the way to apply this specific, particularly, I think, with same-sex attraction is there's a great deal of suffering. I'm telling you, you know, but there's a great deal of suffering that I know people with SSA go through. There's this aching, aching need that can't be met the, through sexual contact, and it's, it's very hard, hard to meet that need. So much of the contemplative prayer, I think, is most useful. Uh, well, let me give you an example. There's a gentleman I was working with with SSA. Um, he got into all. He would tend to get into these different dependent relationships with heterosexual men, and would tend to pursue them and try to make them his daddy or his brothers or something. But fill this need. But he knew, you know, this wasn't working. Uh, he'd still feel, he felt inferior, he'd always feel less than with them. So he'd feel what it, uh, gradually he realized was a temptation to call up this or that guy to kind of get his fix, really, of some sort of male affirmation. And what the Lord led him to was, no, don't make the call. Sit with me in the pain. And so his contemplative prayer for a long time was sitting before the Lord and hurting and letting the Lord gaze on him. And when he would do that, at first, like, he had to practically hold himself down and the couch or the chair with both hands because he just wanted to run because it was so painful. But then there'd be, it's like he'd go through through this wall and there'd be a sense of peace. And as he got into that practice, he was able to do that more and more where he wouldn't give in to the Temptation to try to fill up with this or that unhealthy attachment. And what the Lord did with him was rather remarkable. He had had a chronic sense of being empty. And as he did this contemplative prayer, which was simply sitting before the Lord and hurting, he started to feel full, quite full. And the need to make the phone call started to fade. So that was a tremendous healing for him. 
And then in terms of how we began to relate to heterosexual men, there's quite a bit more freedom in it. It wasn't this, you know, he would relate because he wanted to, not because he, you know, had to. Okay, let's see, where are we? Hmm, better start moving into the home stretch here. Okay. Uh, let's see, I'm skipping all sorts of slides here. All right. Going into the third type of prayer I'm going to cover is acts of consecration. And an act of consecration, by definition, is giving yourself over entirely, surrendering yourself over entirely to the Lord. But because we know in the communion of saints you can do this also with other people in the communion of saints, effectively, if I surrender myself completely to the Blessed Mother, it is simply a, an avenue of surrendering myself completely to the Lord. Because she, as you know, brings us to Jesus. If I make an act of consecration to St. Joseph, it is effectively, through his mediation the mediation of his foster fatherhood, which I can experience through the consecration, but it's also, a, he's a path to Jesus. The, all the saints are going to lead us to Jesus because that's what they want to do. The reason it can be healing for people with same-sex attraction, though, is a major struggle with same-sex attraction is ambivalence. It's I desperately need my dad and want his approval and affirmation, and yet I have this contempt for him, or I... I I want to connect on a healthy way with my mom, but she just seems to be so controlling and she can't, she's crashing my boundaries all the time or she's just ineffectual. I, I'd like to connect with her, but I just, she just is kind of pathetic or something like that. I mean, sorry. To <laughs> <laughs> so um, in acts of consecration, by definition, they're not going to have that ambivalence or they can be a very healthy antidote, antidote toward the ambivalence. It's a, um, people with SSA tend to have a hard, uh, there's that well-grounded fear of getting hurt, so it's, the inclination is not to entrust myself wholeheartedly to someone. So there's actually consecration or a healthy antidote. Um, and the goal of the consecration is to enter into a relationship, either enter into a relationship or a deeper relationship with Jesus, with St. Joseph, with the, with the Blessed Mother, or with, with, with other ones of the saints. Um, it can be healing for men and women dealing with this, uh, their deep fear of close, vulnerable relationships. There's a bunch of popular acts of consecration. A popular one, of course, to, to Jesus is the soul of Christ, Anima Christi, the morning offering, St. Ignatius's take, Lord, and receive. Um, to, me, to the Blessed Mother, there's the defont, demand for consecration. There's the prayer of my queen, my mother. Uh, but as with everything else in the world, just Google it. Google consecration, <laughs> acts of consecration, and you will find myriad consecrations. To the Sacred Heart, I want to say some things. Uh, I mean, the first of all, the consecrations that are most going to be most powerful, are, of course, first to Jesus, to God the Father, to, you know, to the Trinity, to the Blessed Mother, and to St. Joseph. Um, I just want to explain a little bit with St. Joseph is St. Joseph was the one that was Jesus' human model of healthy, holy masculinity. We need St. Joseph. I mean, he, you can be saved without St. Joseph. I know that. But he's really, really important. I think someone was just talking about how important he is, and that's right on. Uh, actually, uh, that was in uh, the bishop's uh, talk. Um, the consecration, it's not a one-time deal because, you know, as you... If you've surrendered your life to the Lord, you know that it's not a one-time thing. You have to keep renewing that. Same thing with the consecration. Um, there was a gentleman dealing with same-sex attraction who, he had quite an experience. I, uh, he was in a chapel, and he had had a very conflicted relationship with his mother. And he had an actual vision, like not in here, but out there. He had a vision of the Blessed Mother Hmm, this gets to me. And she was nursing Jesus. So Jesus was at her breast. And he said, can I look? <laughs> can I come close? And she's like, sure, you know. And he doesn't know why this happened. The way he explained it to me, though, is something happened there in his relationship with his mother. There was a tremendous healing that happened. It was really the path toward a tremendous deal of recovery in his uh, same-sex attraction. 
Um, just a, a final kind of consecration that's, I, I was going to say about the, well, two things. The, the Sacred Heart, how many people are Sacred Heart fans? It just doesn't get any better than the Sacred Heart. That's what I think. Okay. There's an image from Julian of Norwich, the book Showings. Uh, it's so beautiful. She had, you know, Showings is this uh, 14th century anchoress, anchoress. So she lived in, she was walled in, in this, beside this chapel and prayed all the time. <laughs> That's simple definition. Uh, she had the, a series of visions of Jesus crucified. And in one of the visions, Jesus is hanging on the cross. He looks into his side, into the wound in his side, with joy. And he says, see how I loved you. See how I loved you. And she said, and I looked in, and inside was a place spacious and pleasant and with room enough for all humanity. Hallelujah. So, climb in. Make yourself at home. It's a great place to be. It's just beautiful. And just to, now, and this, this last thing is just a footnote. It's not about, it's not really connected with any of the other things, but in terms of the attachment needs, again, I'm talking about on the order of grace here. The attachment happens on the human level in, in many other ways, but in the order of grace, um, Take your aching longing for connection. Bring it to Jesus, to the Father, to Mary, to St. Joseph. There's one priest I know who is working with people dealing with SSA would tell them, Jesus is the man, and Mary is the woman. So what you think you're looking for from this guy or from this woman, it's not really what you're looking for. And the practice that some gentlemen I know have, again, I've worked mostly with gentlemen, it's sort of like if you see that person where you feel that pull, that strong attraction or longing, you gaze through them to Jesus. You gaze through them to the Blessed Mother. Gaze through them to the Father. Take that longing. It's a good longing. It's a longing for fathering, brothering, mothering, sistering. And look through them to Jesus. And... and the sooner people with SSA know, and, and to, to some extent, everybody, that, that no human being has precisely what we need. But they do. They've got it all. they got it all. They mediate it through human being, but beings, but there's a tremendous remainder that only they can, can meet. Any questions? I don't, and somebody stop me if I'm over. I mean, I know we... I'm at three. I don't know if there's time for questions or not. Is Father Chuck here? Or now I'll put on my glasses so I can see you. <laughs> you were a smiling blur before. Okay. <laughs> Sir. I was just wondering, um, would you say that the relationship of fathers in general with their sons is very good, not so good, or just mediocre? And I wonder if the problem is that <clears throat> there seems to be a fear of males embracing each other, which even fathers pick up toward the son. And it seems to me that if fathers <clears throat> readily embrace their sons, there would be a better bond. Yeah, I mean, I'd say in general, I'd say the relationship of, of fathers to sons is uh, marginal at best. It, 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 it tends not to be very good. In terms of the fear of embracing, I mean, it is kind of, there's something about American culture that's, that's pretty much, pretty different about touch from many, many other cultures. There just isn't as much, you know, you probably heard our personal space thing, you know, for Americans, you stand, you know. I spent some time in Italy and where the t concept of personal space is entirely absent. I went to a concert, and every quarter inch of my body was in contact within this bus with somebody else's body. And they weren't uncomfortable with this at all. You know. And right now, you're just a little too close. You need to back up. You know. <laughs> but I think that there's something in that. Uh, corporate culture is, and a lot of the way workplaces work, but particularly corporate culture is at war with the family in terms of the frequent relocations and the father having to be, be away so much. Of course, with the divorce rate, the, the general placement is going to be of uh, the kids are going to go with mom. 
and they're not going to have a dad around. Uh, that's that's uh, that's part of the situation. I mean, men now are certainly, fathers are more likely to tell their sons, I love you, that kind of thing, or be more physically affectionate, certainly than my father's generation. Um, but, how do I put this? We're in a culture where keeping promises is not and commitments is not seen as very important. So I think part of the problem with the attachment uh, and, you know, like, for instance, my wife and I, praise God by his grace, have a, a good, good marriage. But there was a period where my son were like, you know, how do I know you're not going to divorce? Because I know all these people whose parents have divorced. So that's going to make for, just to be in a culture that's so riddled by divorce is going to make for some insecurity of attachment. Uh, I'm not sure if I, did I answer your question? Okay. Hi, yes. Um, I have a problem with picturing the Father as a loving God, and even Jesus to some extent, but mm -hmm. more, more with the Father. I always feel like he's angry at me because mm -hmm. of my sins, and, and like I have to repent. And I, even if I do repent, I feel like I didn't do it well enough or whatever, and, mm -hmm. and he's still mad, and he's still going to punish me because of my past sins and things like that. How yeah. do I get over that image? Um, well, I think some of that would be with some scripture passages where God is portrayed as very, very different from that, like that uh, Hosea 11, 1 to 4 that I was talking about. Something can be, uh, you know, one, at one point Jesus said, he who sees me sees the Father. If you go through 1 Corinthians 13, where it talks about what love is, and God is love, kind of meditate on that. God is patient. God is kind. God hopes all things, endures all things. That's not how we often think of God the Father, but it applies perfectly to him as well as Jesus. The contemplative prayer, because it kind of goes around our consciousness, can really address some of that too. It just, it's, I don't know how, it just, it just does. Well, the two different things, I don't know if they're better, but I, the last 20-something, well, 30 years, really, something like that, contemplative prayer has been kind of the heart of my prayer. I do other things in addition, but that's my main prayer, that and Eucharistic adoration. I mean, besides the sacraments. I haven't even brought the sacraments in. Sorry about that, but I haven't. But, uh, but I'd say it's, it's powerful. I think it's an important, a crucial element, I think, as you mature in the Lord. Hmm? Yes, Ken. How many of your um, patients had trauma. My son had cancer at five, and things had changed after that. A lot of rejections and that. I mean, he was a loving father. Was involved, mm -hmm. and he didn't, he didn't like sports, but he liked the band, and he was participating. Right. That. Well, that's an element I didn't actually get into. There's another whole element of connection with peers. So you can have a good connection with your dad, for instance, but not have the connection with peers, and it's very common. I mean, the statistics of like, say, how many boys who end up with SSA. Um, had rheumatic fever is certainly higher than the regular population because one of the things rheumatic fever does is you can't join in sports and that's a big way of bonding with male peers or had some sort of other thing that made them you know gave them physical problems and they couldn't do the the peer to peer body contact rough and tumble kind of thing so that can be another certainly another element uh, I should probably just take one more, and then we should. Ah, <laughs> Father Vaughn. <laughs> I'm a, a by me, uh, either with SSA or not, right? Uh -huh. And I'm uh, uh, using another or looking at another individual, male or female, uh -huh. to be the total source of all my joy and happiness in this world. Yeah. Am I not the devil himself? Well, I think you call it idolatry. That would be idolatry. It, it would be expecting a human being to satisfy what only the Lord can satisfy. It's it's something we're really prone to. It's probably why it's... Uh, in, it, definitely. And, and something that can happen, I think, with same-sex attraction, because the need for connection is so strong, because it didn't happen for whatever reason, 
the, the tendency toward idolatry can be a very strong one. It's like, you know, finally I've met Mr. Wonderful or Ms. Wonderful and finally someone who's going to take care of all this aching, aching need and there's going to be a crash. It won't, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. The way it seems to work is this or that mentor, this or that friendship will fill in a little bit of it and then somebody else will fill in a little bit and a little bit. So it is humanly mediated. I mean, uh, relationships are the Lord's primary way of mediating his healing, human relationships. But then over and above that, as I said, you've got to have the, the, you know, it's St. It's Augustine. I, actually, I think the, the bishop, who, oh, uh, I was going to say St. Say Benedict, which probably isn't far from the truth, Father Benedict, uh, uh, quoted, you know, we, you have made us for ourselves, O Lord, and our hearts are restless till they rest in thee. We have that God-shaped whole. So everybody, I mean, with or without same-sex attraction, uh, is going to get disappointed in human beings if they're going to put all their eggs in that basket. They just can't do it. They're, we're not... We're not yeah. Things. Yeah, I prefer drugs. But no, just, just kidding. Okay. Uh, <laughs> one, okay, one more question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, do you know how hard it is to find a Catholic therapist? Very, very hard. Exactly. It is. And then when you get to our age, Social Security and all that kind of stuff, it's even harder. Yeah. Yeah, you, you want, um, there's one website, I don't know if you're aware of it or not, catholictherapist.com, uh, and you can get some from there. I mean, if you can't get a Catholic therapist, the next best would be a Christian therapist, and you focus on the family, has, has a referral source, and, and they're very good about how they screen, both of those sites are very good about how they screen people. So catholictherapist.com, focus on the family, um, you can go on to, um, uh, there are more therapists now. There's a Catholic therapist who are doing therapy by phone. I mean, it's not, if, it, can you do that? I, I, I do some of that. Uh, I, I do do some of that. If you want my website, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not supposed to be advertising here, I suppose, but anyway, uh, um, if you do, I know someone who definitely does it is Ian Butler by phone. That's his main thing. So if you Google Ian, I-A-N, Butler, B-U-T-L-E-R, um, you will find him. He's in uh, Lincoln. I know he does phone therapy, and I know he works with people with same-sex attraction. Uh, and he, I'm sure he works with parents of people with same-sex attraction. I-A-N. I is an island, A is an Anthony, N is an uh, Nancy Butler, like the butler did it, B-U-T-L-E-R. And I, I'm kind of, kind of trying to discern if I'm going to go into some more of that phone therapy. If you Google me, you probably won't find me. But if you go on to catholictherapist.com, you can find me that way because I'm on there. People to go into therapy for. I mean, there. Yeah, there's such a great. Tremendous need. Yeah. Well, isn't that you've done you've done that with the gay activist in a panel of. Oh yeah, with Mike starting to go into this, you know, I I, I'm sure any therapist who's going into this needs to get geared up for persecution. You know, this is this is not a. The culture is not very friendly to this. Newsflash. Okay, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen.